Hi everybody, welcome to my homestead and welcome to my channel. Uh, this is the second video in my the Sister Wendy Nelson challenge. Uh, challenge accepted. Uh, if you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe, like this video. If you end up liking it, hit the notification bell uh, and leave your comments. I would love to hear what you think about this. All right, so this is uh, President Nelson's second talk as president of the church. Uh, her challenge is to um, uh, check out the, his first 31 um, talks in General Conference. Uh, the challenge was given during the Kansas uh, Oklahoma devotional that uh, they did just recently, uh, just a couple days ago, actually. I live in Kansas, so I took this personally. Um, so this talk is called the ministering with the power or ministering with the power and authority of god and just right off the bat i just want to highlight this word right here again ministering uh, i talked about this in the last video um this is now what we're doing in the church and it for me it brings to mind the ministering of angels um it brings to mind how at some point we're going to be translated quickened and um just how it, th this is a really important word i think right now uh, we know that we've changed from home teaching and visiting teaching to ministering and that's because i think we've reached that uh hinge point that hinge point that president nelson uh talked about and we'll, we'll go we'll go through that talk uh once we get to that point so um let's just get into it here um through a life now i'm just hitting up the you know the things that i've highlighted out of this talk and uh, it'll be up to you up to you to go through the entire thing if that's what you'd like to do um but he says here through a lifetime of service in this church i've all i've learned that it really doesn't matter where one serves uh what the lord cares about is how one serves and i think that's interesting uh and important because you know, unfortunately, I, I think there are some people in the church that strive for certain positions or feel that they're entitled to certain positions because of whatever, either how long they've been uh, in the church or, you know, their age or uh, just simply how spiritual they are or whatever. But that doesn't matter. Right. The Lord is directing the ch his church. He inspires our leaders to choose certain people at certain times for probably many different reasons it's you know it's whoever's going to be the most effective at that time despite their weaknesses and um, perceived weaknesses from others so what it doesn't matter where we serve what calling we have what matters is how we do it right and that we're um, we're pure in heart we're doing things for the right reasons we're not doing it for show we're not we don't care about what what others um think about us or how they view us right all right moving on uh we see faithful women who understand the power inherent in their callings and in their endowment and other temple ordinances these women know how to call upon the powers of heaven to protect and strengthen their husbands their children and others they love these are spiritually strong women who lead teach and minister fearlessly in their callings with the power and authority of God. I know there's been a lot of emphasis on this, how women also have power and authority, even though, even though they aren't given directly the, the priesthood by the laying on of hands, um, they do act with authority and power. And um, anyway, there, there's been recurring things, themes of that. There, there's been a lot of women that have um, kind of like gone against the church and they're they're like demanding that women be ordained to the priesthood and have the same uh callings to the same offices of the priesthood and um it's important to distinguish that there is definitely a difference between men and women and the lord has an order in the way that he does things and um just one thing to keep in mind is that uh for a man to go to the temple he first has to have the priesthood but a woman does not and what what does that say to you so just in, interesting to think about now um there's this foot this footnote here footnote number one uh which takes us to another talk that he gave um this was october 2015 okay so i, I guess this would have been about 
three years uh, before, a little less than three years before he became president of the church. Um, it's called A Plea to My Sisters. And um, I could have done a separate video on this, but I, I want to just go ahead and include it in this video. There's a lot of really good things uh, in this video or in this talk. Um, so he just talks about, you know, the faithful wives of these uh, general authorities that had passed away. And, um, and then he goes on, uh, yet the women of this dispensation are distinct from the women of any other because this dispensation is distinct from any other. Uh, this, dis this distinction brings both privileges and responsibilities. Let's go to this footnote here. Um, no, okay, sorry, I didn't mean to go to that. All right. 36 years ago, in 1979, President Spencer W. Kimball made a profound prophecy about the impact that covenant-keeping women would have on the future of the Lord's Church. Okay, he prophesied. So this, this is a prophecy, and it's regarding women. Much of the major growth that is coming to the church in the last days will come because many of the good women of the world will be drawn to the church in large numbers. Many of the good women of the world of the world will be drawn to the church in large numbers. This will happen to the degree that the women of the church reflect righteousness and articulateness uh, in their lives and to, the degree, and to the degree that the women of the church are seen as distinct and different in happy ways from the women of the world. Okay, so the good women of the world Will be attracted to the church because of the good women of or because of the women of the church and their and them being able to reflect righteousness and articulateness in their lives okay so women you have a great responsibility on your shoulders you are going to be a blessing to those women of the world that um, are seeking for good and this kind of goes along with my argument that I've made in, in previous videos, how I, I really do think, generally speaking, women are better than men in terms of spirituality. I really, really do think that. Um, my dear sisters, uh, you, are, you who are our vital associates during this winding up scene, winding up scene, uh, meaning winding up to the second coming, the day that <clears throat> the day that President Kimball foresaw is today, 2015. When, when was President Kimball president? Let's let's take let's take a look at that. Spencer, what's wrong with me right now? Spencer W. Kimball. Um, okay, let's see. Go to the Wikipedia article. Uh, pre, acting president, quorum president, LDS. Where does it say it? Um, December 1973 to November 5th, 1985. Okay, so from 73 to 85. So he's not talking about the whole dispensation, um, the last dispensation. He's talking about now, uh, at least uh, according to President Nelson as of 2015 and on. Um, let's see, okay, you are the women he foresaw, now, 2015 and, and beyond. Uh, your, your virtue, light, love, knowledge, courage, character, faith, and righteous lives will draw good women of the world, along with their families, to the church in unprecedented numbers. There's a footnote for that. Um, I have to zoom out and, or I have to zoom in uh, in order to read this because there's a thing here you can't see that's in the way. Um, footnote six, when I was born, there were f fewer than 600,000 members of the church. Today, there are more than 15 million. And uh, as of today, it, the, uh, now that I'm making this video, there's 17 million. That number will continue to increase. Um, 
we, your brethren, need, need your strength, your conversion, your conviction, your ability to lead, your wisdom, and your voices. The kingdom of God is not and cannot be complete without women who make sacred covenants and then keep them. Women who can speak with the power and authority of God. And there's a footnote for that. Uh, President Joseph Fielding Smith told Sisters of the Relief Society, You can speak with authority because the Lord has placed authority upon you. He also said that the Relief Society has been given power and authority to do great, a great many things. The, the work which they do is done by divine authority. Uh, these quotations were also cited by Elder Dallin H. Oaks in a conference address, The Keys and Authority of the Priesthood. All right. Uh, we need women with the gift of discernment who can view the trends of the world, right? What are the things that are being promoted really, really heavily right now in commercials, TV, movies, just pop culture in general? We need people with the gift of discernment who can view the trends in the world and detect those that, however popular, are shallow or dangerous. Think about this. Think, think about the trends that we see in the world right now. What, what do you think he's talking about right there? Uh, today, let me add that we need women who know how to make important things uh, happen by their faith and who are courageous defenders of morality. What, what's traditionally related with morality and families in a sin-sick world? We need women who are devoted to shepherding God's children along the covenant path toward exaltation. Women who know how to receive personal revelation. There's been lots of talk about receiving personal revelation, um, you know, for the last few years. Um, he's also said that uh, we're not going to be able to survive spiritually in coming days without personal revelation. revelation. And I think it has to do with these trends. <clears throat> that are really popular, that are making people want to uh, uh, basically leave the church because they can't have both, and so they choose the popular, right? Um, who understand the power and peace of the temple endowment, women who know how to call upon the powers of heaven to protect and strengthen children and families, women who teach fearlessly. So, we, know, we need to go to the temple. We need to think about the endowment. We need to uh, study it as much as possible. Uh, try and learn from it. Um, and then call upon the powers of heaven. All right, what else do we got here? <clears throat> Married or single, you sisters possess distinctive capabilities and special intuition you've received as gifts from God. We brethren cannot duplicate your unique influence. We know that the culminating act of all creation was the creation of woman. We need your strength. Footnote 11. <clears throat> Oops. Footnote. Why can't I zoom? What's going on? There we go. Um, all the purposes of the world and all that was in the world would be brought to naught without woman, a keystone in the priesthood in the priesthood arc of creation. A keystone in the priesthood arc of creation. Uh, Eve became God's final creation, the grand summation of all the marvelous work that had gone before. That was by uh, Gordon B. Hinckley. I remember him saying that in conference. Um, and that always, uh, that always stuck with me. Okay. Attacks against the church. Uh, think about who attacks the church and its doctrine. What, what kind of people do that? Um, attacks against the church, its doctrine, and our way of life are going to increase. Because of this, we need women who have a bedrock understanding of the doctrine of Christ, and he'll who will use the understanding to teach and help raise a sin resistant generation. Are, are we doing that? Are we, are you making sure uh, 
you who have children, are you trying to help them become sin resistant in this generation? We need women who can detect deception in all its forms. We need women who can detect deception in all its forms. What, what kind of deceptions are there? Uh, I know that there's kind of a rise of like, oh, you don't need to change. You're, you're perfect just how you are. Um, you know, all truth is relative. Um, what's important is that, anyway, you guys know what I'm talking about. And it's not just one particular thing either. There's like many, many things that, that um, certain philosophies of the world are pushing for. Um, this is a really bad time that we're that we're living in. Um, I plead with you to fulfill President Kimball's prophecy. Again, this was this was a prophecy that he made that you, the women of the church, will help bring in women of the world and their families. Um, I bear witness of the reality of the Lord Jesus Christ and of his redeeming, atoning, and sanctifying power. And as one of his apostles, I thank you, my dear sisters, and bless you to rise to your full stature, to fulfill the measure of your creation, uh, as we walk arm in arm in this sacred work. Now check this out. Together, we will help prepare the world for the second coming of the Lord. President Nelson talks a lot about the second coming. He talks a lot about the second coming. And remember, this is back in 2015. All right, so let's go back now to uh, the talk that we were going over, um, Ministering with Power and Authority of God, uh, his second talk in General Conference as president. Um, likewise, we see faithful men who live up to their privileges as bearers of the priesthood. They lead and serve by sacrifice in the Lord's way with love, kindness, and patience. They bless, guide, protect, and strengthen others by the power of the priesthood they hold. Uh, they bring miracles to those they, they serve while they keep their own marriages and families safe. They shun evil and are mighty elders in Israel. That's another thing he talks about quite a bit is Israel, right? Specifically uh, scattered Israel. Uh, there's a footnote. Let's see what that says. Um, see, pre why did I? Oh wait, let me click on that. Okay, he uh, he references some scriptures here that I would like to go over. Um, Alma thirteen seven through eight. This high priesthood, being after the order of his son, which order was from the foundation of the world, or in other words, being without beginning of days or end of years, being prepared from eternity to all eternity, according to his foreknowledge of all things. Now, they were ordained after this manner, being called with a holy calling, and ordained with a holy ordinance, and taking upon them a high priesthood of the holy order, which calling... which which calling and ordinance and high priesthood is without beginning or end. Uh, now, this is in the Book of Mormon. So it's the Book of Mormon talking about the priesthood. Doctrine and Covenants 84, 17 through 20, and then 35 through 38. Which priesthood continueth in the church of God in all generations and is without be beginning of days or end of years? Uh, the Lord confirmed a priesthood also upon Aaron and his seed, throughout all their generations, which priesthood also continueth and abideth forever with the priesthood which is after the holiest order of God. Um, and this greater priesthood administereth the gospel and holdeth the key of the mysteries of the kingdom, even the key of the knowledge of God. I feel like that's been talked a lot about a lot too recently is uh, how the priesthood holds the key of the knowledge of God. Therefore, in the ordinances thereof, the power of godly, godliness is manifest, and also all they who receive the priesthood receive me, saith the Lord. For he that receiveth my servants receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth my father, and he that receiveth my father receiveth my father's kingdom. Therefore, all that my father hath, hath shall be given unto him. So, uh, yeah, I think it's important that we receive... Um, 
the priesthood, the ordinances uh, that we receive. Let's see. And, and also they who receive his priesthood receiveth me. So if you receive the priesthood, you're receiving the Lord. And in turn, you're receiving the Father. And in turn, you're receiving all that the Father hath. The, the priesthood is really important. It's been forever, right? Without beginning of days and end of years. That's like repeated twice uh, between both of these scriptures. So uh, it talks about the, the, the distinction between the, the two priesthoods, the higher priesthood and the lower priesthood, which uh, I would argue there's kind of like a pattern there because the Aaronic priesthood um, has more to do with the outer things, right? And then the, the Melchizedek priesthood has more to do with the inner things. So it's almost like you have like a male and a female type priesthood. Not not that, I mean, I don't want that to be misconstrued. Just, just saying that it's like, it's a type that, um, you know, men are generally thought of as like outside the home, protecting, defending, earning, uh, you know, uh, their money and stuff to provide for the family. And the women, the woman is inside the home making the home and making it what it is, making it a holy place. And it's much higher. And we know that woman comes after man in the creation story. Not that she's last, but that, you know, maybe she's the highest, right? I really do think that women are better than, <laughs> than men. Uh, and it's stuff like this that makes me, me think that. So, uh, all right. Yeah, let's, let's move on. Uh, now, may I voice a concern? Uh, it is this. Too many of our brothers and sisters do not fully understand understand the concept of priesthood power and authority. Yeah, I don't think they do. I, I don't think they do on many different levels. Um, now, this is, this is like another uh, talk. This, this section right here that's like always stuck in my mind because it, it's like a, you know, it's like an admonition from him. It's a, a little bit of a chastening kind of. Uh, they act as though they would rather satisfy their own selfish desires and appetites than use the power of God to bless his children. I'm just going to be frank, okay? There are different types of people in the world, and I think there's kind of like, uh, well, I think, you know, there's those that are more narcissistic, okay? I think that's one big group. People that um, are narcissists. You'll have to study narcissism on your own, um, and I would encourage you to do so. But these kind of people, these people that are farther down on that spectrum, they seek for power. They seek for attention. They seek for praise. Think about Satan. Every time that Satan shows up, he's always demanding that people worship him and obey him, and he wants all the glory, right? And um, so people here in this life that are more narcissistic and, and are seeking for those kind of things, um, they're going to want power wherever it is. And, it, and it, it's in every single organization. It's not just in church. It's everywhere, right? It's in uh, groups of friends. It's in politics. It's at school. It's any organization, any group of people, they're going to be those that want to be higher up in the pecking order. And, um, and I think that that's something that we see here uh, in the church, specifically this group of women that feel that somehow they're being uh, slighted or they're being left out by not having the priesthood. Um, just like President Nelson says here, he thinks that too many of our brothers and sisters do not fully understand the concept of priesthood power. I think a lot of people view it as like, like, um, like the X-Men, like having special powers or it's like something that you can use when you want and it's to, you know, they want, they want, but that's not how it is. Both men and women have the priesthood. Um, think about the temple. Think again, think about how women don't need the priesthood to enter into the temple. And let's remember that women, men and women are different. And that doesn't mean that one's better than the other. Um, both are absolutely necessary. Right? It's like when you think about computers, you have hardware and you have software. The hardware is like the keyboard, the mouse, the monitor, um, the physical components, right? And But it's no good unless it has software to run on it, right? First, you have to have the hardware. 
And I think there's kind of a lesson there, like when you think about man being created first uh, before women. But then once you have the hardware in place, then you can start running software. And the software is where the meaning comes from. That's that's what you want to do with the hardware. You want to be able to interact with the software. You want to be able to get on the Internet. You want to be able to use um, different programs, right? The, the programs are like the women. That's that's what you want to that's what give otherwise the hardware is just a it's just a paperweight it's it's useless so uh it's like these people that think that they need to have the man's priesthood power they they don't understand priesthood at all <laughs> they really don't it's not a superpower i mean it is all powerful but men and women share in it uh it it's just like it's a very superficial understanding of what the priesthood is um if, okay so do you not understand okay let me give you some examples not long ago i attended a sacrament meeting in which a new baby was given a name and a father's blessing the young father held his precious infant in his arms gave her a name and then offered a beautiful prayer uh prayer is italicized uh, but he did not give the child a blessing. That sweet baby girl got a name, but no blessing. The, the dear elder did not know the difference between a prayer and a priesthood blessing. That's it's kind of harsh, but sometimes there there's time you know there's times where um, sharp words in stuff is needed. Uh, with his priesthood authority and power, he could have blessed his infant, but he did not. I thought, what a missed opportunity. Let me cite some other examples. Uh, we know of brethren who set sisters apart as primary young women or Relief Society leaders and teachers, but failed to bless them, to bless them with the power to fulfill their callings. They give only admonitions and instructions. We see a worthy father who fails to give his wife and his uh, children priesthood blessings when that is exactly what they need. A priesthood power has been restored to this earth, and yet far too many brothers and sisters go through terrible trials in life without ever receiving a true priesthood blessing. What a tragedy. That's a tragedy we can eliminate. So the priesthood is not for us to feel like we have power. It's not for us to feel like we're special or to get attention. Um, it's to bless others and eliminate trials in life. <laughs> that may not be necessary um, and, and much more than that much more than that um, brethren we hold the holy priesthood of God we have his authority to bless his people just think of the remarkable assurance the Lord has given us when he said whomsoever I bless <clears throat> whomsoever you bless I will bless it is our, our privilege to act in the name of Jesus Christ to bless God's children according to his will for them Stake presidents and bishops, please ensure that every member of the quorums within your stewardship understand how uh, to give a priesthood blessing, including the personal worthiness and spiritual preparation required to call fully upon the power of God. And there is a footnote I would like to go over. If I could, okay. The connection between the power of the priesthood and personal righteousness is developed more fully in Russell M. Nelson, The Price of Priesthood Power. So um, you have to be per you have to be righteous on a personal uh, per righteous on a personal lever level. <laughs> oh my gosh! Uh, in order to be effective in using the priesthood. Um, and that's probably that's probably a good talk to check out if you want to do that. Um, the hallmark of the Lord's true and living church will always be an organized, directed effort to minister. There's that word again, minister, to individual ch children of God and their families. Because it is his church, we as his servants will minister, there it is again, to one, other, one another, or to the one just as he did. There's a footnote for that, which brings up uh, 3 Nephi 17, verses 9 through 10, and then 20 through 21. And it came to pass that when he had thus spoken, all the multitude with one accord did go forth 
with their sick and their afflicted and their lame and with their blind and their dumb and with all them that were afflicted in any manner and he did heal them every one as they were brought forth unto him uh, and they did all both both they who had been healed and they who were whole bow down at his feet and did worship him and as many as could come uh, for the multitude did, did kiss his feet insomuch that they did bathe his feet with their tears I always think that's gross and they arose from the earth and he said unto them blessed are ye because of your faith and now behold my joy is full and when he had said these words he wept and the multitude bear record of it and he took their little children one by one and blessed them and prayed unto the father for them all right let's close out of that uh we will minister in his name there's the word again uh with his power and authority and with his loving kindness uh, an experience I had more than 60 years ago in Boston taught me just how powerful the privilege of ministering one-on-one -on -one can be. And then uh, he tells a story here, but I'm not going to go over that. But essentially, um, there was a man that basically, him and his wife, they were sealed in the temple, but then he fell away. But then through a personal experience that President Nelson had one-on-one -on -one with him, um, because they, they were assigned to him as his home teaching family um, because he showed interest in him and, and made a personal connection. Um, he essentially came back to the church and um, became a stake president and then a patriarch and, and it was incredible. And uh, the part that I want to highlight about that is his and Leonora's influence can, will continue to ripple through many generations throughout the world. You guys, everything that we do, all the, the words that we speak, the way that we treat others, and especially in this case where we make the effort to um, treat people as individuals and do one-on-one, -on -one, um, well, ministering, uh, all of that ripples throughout all of reality, throughout the entire world, throughout the universe, however you want to think about it. Um, we need to be putting more good into the world than bad because there are chain reactions that take place uh, with with everything with everything that we do everything that we do so it's really important to focus on individuals it's really important to um make sure that we're putting good into the world and i don't want to sound like a new age person by saying that i mean that that's something that they do have right but um, we really do have a ripple effect uh, with with how we interact with others and it, and it goes beyond just them it, it, it ripples on through many generations to other people um, so the the power that we have is uh, incredible right not even having priesthood not even having it just being a human being the power that we have uh, in the way that we impact the world is is really powerful so we need to make sure that we do what we can to change it for good and to bring others to Christ all right now uh, to close up here uh, we are the men who have been called and prepared from the foundation of the world according to the foreknowledge of God on account of our exceeding faith to do his work <clears throat> I've made the analogy before that you know when you're in the military and uh, I can only speak for the army but I know it's the same with the other branches but you know when you get deployed you don't they don't just like ship you over there and then they're like here take take a weapon and then hey i need you to go over there and you know shoot the bad guys no it, it doesn't work like that um before okay before you go to the deployment there is a whole long series uh I, sometimes i feel like it's overly long um and redundant but no it's probably a good thing a whole long series of trainings that you have to do <clears throat> ranging from like land nav they have like a, a medical training uh which really sucks it's called i think it was called like the mist course or something like that or mystic training um it, it's like it's a medical training and it, it's just awful um and then um with your weapon whatever weapon you're assigned you're, you're assigned a weapon in the first place they don't just give you a random weapon 
where you can't just like go to the arms room and be like, hey, I, I think I need a machine gun for this one. Uh, no, no, wait, a sniper rifle. Um, you're assigned a weapon, and before you go to the deployment, you qualify on that weapon system, whatever it is. You have to go to the range, you have to at least get um, a marksman level. There's marksman and then sharpshooter and then expert. Those are like the three levels. You have to at least get marksman <laughs> to be qualified on that weapon system. And then that's the weapon that you'll use when you're deployed. And, and in my case, when we went there to Bagram, uh, we qualified, well, we didn't qualify again, but we went to the range again to make sure that our our weapons were calibrated or uh, the other word for it is zeroed so that you know that when you're looking through the site you're shooting in the right spot and it's it's still good so and then not only that but there's other things like um you know uh, in the army we have qualifications to become uh, airborne which is where you jump out of planes or um, air assault where you jump out of helicopter like you repel out of helicopters and you have to go through a special school for that. And then, you know, so for like uh, in World War II D-Day, uh, there was an amphibious attack, uh, which was performed by the army, by the way, not the Marines, uh, but that's just a side note. Um, at the same time that there were soldiers doing the amphibious attack, there was an airborne operation that was going as well. Um, and they parachuted in behind enemy lines and they had to go to airborne school before they did that. And I would suggest that Everyone that's part of this dispensation, like it says here, we were called and prepared from the foundation of the world. We are all uh, latter-day qualified, so to speak. All of us, all of us that are in the church, um, you know, we didn't just come here. It didn't just like, you know, it all happened to happen here. In this, you know, you know, it was all just random, or it just how the uh, it was all in the car, or you know what I mean. It wasn't random. Uh, we've all been prepared before this life, and uh, we are all Latter-day, and I would say Second Coming qualified. And so um, our involvement in this life and this world and this dispensation is like is really, really important. So, uh, and then let's just finish it up here. Tonight, I invite you literally, literally to rise up with me in our great eternal brotherhood. When I name your priesthood office... Please stand and remain standing. Deacons, please arise. Teachers, arise. Priests, bishops, elders, high priests, patriarchs, seventies, apostles. Now, brethren, <clears throat> will you please remain standing and join our chorus in singing all three verses of Rise Up, O Men of God. I think that's really uh, interesting on many different levels. Um, you know, this was a, a physical act of standing up, um, and it's meant to impress on your minds, like, hey, stand, like, wake up, stand up. Uh, that's what I get out of it. Like, wake up, stand up, um, get ready for this, right? Um, another another thing that you could maybe think about, this is probably not what he meant, but, like, again, you, I kind of think a little bit about being caught up. Right? There's a lot of imagery when it comes to being translated and quickened that you're going to be going up, up into the, the cloud to meet Christ at his second coming. Um, so that, that's, like, that's just like another thing that kind of comes to mind a little bit. But uh, check this out. I, I pulled up the, um, the hymn, okay, uh, and this is how it reads. Rise up, O men of God, have done with lesser things. Give heart and soul and mind and strength to serve the King of Kings. Rise up, O men of God, in one united throng. Bring in the day of brotherhood and end the night of wrong. Rise up, O men of God, uh, tread where his feet have trod. As brothers of the Son of Man, rise up, O men of God. And it's interesting because it, uh, the reference down here for this hymn is Doctrine and Covenants section 4. And if you're familiar with that, this is the famous, um, you know, missionary section. Uh, we had to learn and memorize this on my mission, and I, I think they probably still do that today. But this is like a really big uh, second coming section, uh, and specifically um, talking about doing missionary work, uh, 
behold, the field is white, uh, is all ready to harvest, right? Because this lead up to the second coming, this is the final heart, or this is the last harvest, it's the wheat harvest. Um, so, you know, it's really appropriate that he's talking about this and then having them rise up and um, sing this hymn you know, to serve the king of kings, that the king who is coming, right? Uh, using the word king, that's kind of important because Christ, you know, it's his kingdom. It, it came when he came the first time, when he was during his mortal life. That's when the kingdom started. We've done a video about that, that that's when it actually started. But it went away for a time during the great apostasy, but now it's back. And he's coming back as a literal as a literal actual king of the world <laughs> so uh standing up singing this hymn it's referring to uh the last great harvest and thrusting in your sickle uh with your might uh so yeah it it's pretty pretty cool i think that he chose this definitely on purpose and it, it makes sense that this uh the scripture would be associated with it uh, I didn't, why didn't I look at this? What's Timothy 6, 11 through 12? Uh, let's just read it. But thou, O man, but thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Okay. All right. And then, um, and then he ends off just like in this, uh, just like in this talk here, a plea to my sisters. He ends by talking about the second coming. Together, we will help prepare the world for the second coming of the Lord. And then here he says, uh, while you sing, think of your duty as God's mighty army to help prepare the world for the second coming of the Lord. This is our charge. This is our privilege. I highlighted army also because uh, President Nelson, he was actually, he was in the army. So uh, we're army brothers, me and him. <laughs> and uh, uh, it's interesting that uh, you'll remember that in the 2018, in the, in the same year as this talk, he did the um, Worldwide Youth Devotional where he introduced the concept of the Lord's Youth Battalion, which is more kind of like army imagery, right? So he says it right here, God's mighty army. He he um, organized the, the Lord's youth battalion, um, all of this leading to clear the way to fight the fight uh, before the, the Lord's second coming. And then, um, did it say something here? Unite one throng. Um, I don't know. Okay. So anyway, just, I think that's really cool. And I, I really like that. The, the army metaphor visuals and the organization that he's doing in the church so yeah he ends this talk talking about the second coming so uh he's definitely big on the second coming all right so i'll end it there um if you haven't already please make sure to subscribe like this video if you liked it hit the notification bell and then uh leave your comments with all your thoughts and if you have any additional uh sources of information i'd like to go through that um, I'll mention all your comments in a future comments episode, and I'll talk to you guys later.